everybody. Welcome back to Crux Ministries. This is David Witt and Sarah Witt. And uh, we're beginning or re-beginning our study of Genesis. This is part three of our look at the book of Genesis. And today we will be looking at Genesis 2, 4 through 4, 26. And if you remember from our previous PowerPoints, we're focusing on uh, the sections of the book that usually are translated in English as uh, these are the generations of or this is the account of. Uh, and today is the account of the heavens and the earth, or the toldoth, which is the Hebrew word for account or generations. The toldoth of the heavens and the earth. So let's begin. Just a reminder, the translation that we are reading from is the uh, web version or web translation. So um, in case it doesn't sound like exactly like yours, that's the reason. Right, and that's a World English Bible, and remember, it's a copyright-free edition. That's why we're using it. All right, just a quick review of where we were last time. Uh, if you remember, I spoke about, or we spoke about, uh, notice the opening line there at the top of your slide, if you have those available, or if you're just listening. Um, just listen along. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Remember, those two adjectives were uh, the key terms that are used throughout the rest of the introduction of Genesis there in 1, 1 to 2, 3. You'll notice how I kind of put this in a chart form for us to see. Um, the first three days, God is... Uh, taking care of the formless aspect by uh, dividing light from darkness, heaven from seas, by heaven I mean sky, uh, and then day three, the land from the sea, so he's giving form to his creation, and then four, five, and six, he's taking care of the empty or the void, depending on what translation you have, by filling uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, um, the sea life and the sky life, or vice versa, and then the animals and mankind. You'll notice a pattern emerges here, which is key to understanding uh, any Hebrew book, which includes, of course, the Old Testament, but also a lot of the books of the New Testament. Uh, I think there's only one or two, Luke and Acts, that were written by a non-Jewish author. Um, so this is kind of the way uh, Jewish poetry works. Um, in English, I, I say this often when we're teaching material out of the Old Testament. In English, when you think of poetry, you think of, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, uh, rhyme. You think of meter, you know, the number of syllables in a sentence. Um, with Hebrew, Hebrew poetry is about paralleling. Um, and you can parallel things in two primary ways. You can parallel them because they're the same, or contrast them, I should say, maybe is a better word. You contrast them or compare them because they're the same, or you contrast and compare them because they're different. Um, I always use the example of Psalm 1. Uh, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, etc., etc., but the wicked are not so... Um, you'll notice how he's contrasting two kinds of people, and that's really the content of the entire psalm. Well, here, he noticed the paralleling we have, so day one and day four correspond, day two and day five correspond, day three and day six correspond. Uh, notice how light and darkness is day one, but then the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, the sun for the light, the moon and the stars for the darkness. Uh, day two is the sky and the seas. He fills the sky in day five with birds. He fills the seas in day five with all kinds of creatures, it says. Uh, day six is the land and the sea. Uh, and um, in day, yeah, day three is the land and the sea. I think I just said day six. And then day six, he fills the land with animals and, of course, with mankind. Um, so there's definitely paralleling happening here. Uh, and then, of course, we have day seven, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. The heavens and the earth and all their vast array were finished. God finished his work, which he had done, and rested on the seventh day. 
So again, that's what we looked at uh, last time we were together. Today we're going to be moving on to the account of the heavens and the earth and the day they were created, which is where we find what's commonly called the fall, the Garden of Eden and the fall. So let's begin. Uh, we're going to start in Genesis 2 and read verses 4 through 7. Sarah? This is the, the history of the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. No plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up. For Yahweh God had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was not a man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right, excellent. Um, where do we begin? Uh, first of all, again, notice the chapter heading or the you know, book within a book. So Genesis is one book, but it's really 13 distinct books based on the repetition of that phrase, generations, uh, or sometimes translated account, or the Hebrew word toldoth. This is the history of. So you can tell just from the introduction, he's starting a new thought for us. Um, this is how, uh, I should say, I suspect with a high degree of certainty, this is how Moses divided Genesis for his readers. Um, as we said before, remember the numbers that we associate with the books, chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, th those are uh, uh, superscribed over the text in the Middle Ages. So don't let them distract you from understanding the flow of a book, and oftentimes they do, because we get so fixated on the street address, as it's called, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, we get so fixated on the street address um, that we forget that there's a, a, a style, a form that the book is taking in and of itself above and beyond all of that. Uh, anyway, so let's move on. No plant of the field was yet in the earth. No herb had yet sprung up. Um, there was not a man to till the ground. Something I find interesting about this little paragraph in verses 5 and 6 is notice how Moses is previewing where he wants to take you. Um, He's alluding to what it is he wants to talk about. The fact is there is no man. So notice how creation itself is trying to get to man, just as the book of Genesis is trying to get to Adam um, or Abraham, um, to Egypt, right, as Sarah uh, talked about uh, in the second, I think, uh, podcast that we put together for you. Uh, Yahweh God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Notice how the word formed is used, which is rather interesting. Um, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but here it says that God formed the animals uh, in the previous chapter and formed man in this chapter. Um, and then, of course, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Um, a living being is perhaps a better uh, idea or, or translation for that term. Um, soul just means a being. Um, we tend to think of, uh, uh, you hear the expression a lot, man is body, soul, and spirit. Um, uh, soul is just a word for being, like a living being. Um, but anyway... Um, another thing I want to point out here is uh, the, the names of God that are used. So your Bible may say um, Lord. the Lord God. Right. Uh, when you see the word Lord in English Bibles in all caps, that typically is the proper name of God that is given. Um, it's yod He vav He in Hebrew. And technically... Um, we have added the vowels in here. Um, yod he, yod he is is kind of an unpronounceable word in Hebrew. Um, so we've added in vowels to make it pronounceable. Um, God is usually Elohim in the Hebrew. Right. And by we, you mean? 
Christians and English people. Right. Well, <laughs> and people. and the the Jews themselves, um, the Jewish language contains no vowels. Um, so they had to add them in to help with pronunciation. Um, and that's, by the way, when Jesus says one jot or tittle, um, he's referring to accent marks in the Hebrew, no, which, no, no, wait a minute. That was added also in the Middle Ages, but our Middle Ages. Well, but jots and tittles are accent, no? Nope. See, corrected once again. <laughs> that's why I have her here. Um Anyway, scrap that. Uh, uh, big picture time. So let's take a step back. Um, a lot of people read this center paragraph, verses 5 and 6. No plant of the field was yet in the earth. No herb had yet sprung up. Um, because God had not caused it to rain. And then God formed man. Because these two ideas are together in a paragraph, or what we suspect is a paragraph, um, uh, is not to imply that when God created man at the same moment there were no plants that had sprung up. Uh, remember, plants were formed on day three when God was um, adding form to the land. Um, we looked at that in our previous paragraph. Again, m my suspicion is, uh, and for good, good reason, uh, God is trying to set up the contrast between um, the wild things and the garden, which is where this text is going. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the podcast. So I just want to kind of preview that information for us um, before we get into it uh, in a little bit more detail as we go along. All right, our next set of verses here comes from chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. It says, Yahweh God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, Yahweh God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it was parted and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, and it flows through the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Uh, Bedillium, which is incense, and onyx stone are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the same river that flows through the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hadekel, or Tigris in some translations. This is the one which flows in front of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Yahweh God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. Uh, first thing we want to talk about, let's go uh, looking at our slides that we accompany with our podcast, if you can. Um, there are three places which are named uh, in the discussion about the rivers that flow out of Eden. There is Assyria, there is Havilah, which is essentially modern-day Saudi Arabia, and there is Cush which is essentially modern-day uh, Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia. It's basically um, the, the lands south of Egypt proper um, and, and what we would commonly kind of think of as the Horn of Africa today. Um, two of these rivers we, we obviously know about uh, to this day because they're given the modern names at least in some translations the Tigris and Euphrates those rivers still exist they they flow out of Syria down into the Persian Gulf through the country of Iraq but the modern country of Iraq um, Sarah I think has a, a, a few thoughts on some of these uh, land masses here that are mentioned so so one thing that's interesting is um, the Gishon is not a so much a river as it is a spring, and it's a spring that is 
located on the east side of Jerusalem and it flows um, well it has been diverted it was diverted um, originally into the valley that was on the west side uh, or east side sorry of Jerusalem to water what was called the King's Gardens and then um, King Hezekiah uh, in the threat of in the face of the threat of the Assyrian army coming to siege Jerusalem he uh, walled it up it closed it in and diverted it into a pool which is in the south part of Jerusalem so um, it's interesting that it's it's a spring and not a river another interesting thing is if you look at a, a map that is um, that shows the lines of the tectonic plates there's a the the Jordan River Valley is is right on one of those lines and so is Jerusalem um, it's why you see lots of um, accounts of earthquakes and things that happen so my question for you is is it possible that the Gishon at one time was flowing into the Jordan um, and the Dead Sea was flowing out into the Red Sea um, because that is the one that flows through the land of Cush so if it were to have connected at one point in time, um, that is all one line on a tectonic map that shows um, it just runs right down all the way down into the Red Sea, and the Red Sea is expanding. So um, anyway, just a, an interesting thought. It, we don't have any necessarily any proof of that, um, but it's just one of the things that makes you go, hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, of course we've got what's called the Great Rift Valley, which runs through Africa, and the Jordan Valley and Dead Sea itself is the lowest point on Earth that is not underwater. Not the lowest point on Earth anywhere, but the lowest point on Earth which is not underwater. It is 400 feet below sea level. Um, so it, it uh, geographically speaking, or geologically speaking, um, it is a unique place on Earth, uh, and this piggybacks exactly onto what Sarah was just saying. It's, it's rather interesting to note that there's this uh, uh, remarkable valley that goes through the land, most of which is dry, some of which is underwater, um, uh, and it happens to go around the very land which... Uh, uh, the text speaks of here in this case that river the Gihon River which flowed out of Eden no longer exists but there is a Gihon Spring which is in Jerusalem as Sarah said um, it seems that the geography or geology has probably changed significantly enough that we really can't identify where all this is um, but my my uh best guess is i i suspect that eden is probably jerusalem um the reason i say that is because of the central role jerusalem plays throughout the biblical history um it's where abraham was asked to offer isaac but then of course uh in the the story um, they find a, a ram in the thicket instead. It's where David uh, stopped the plague, which then uh, led to him building the temple there. Um, it's, of course, where Jesus is crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. Uh, m again, my suspicion doesn't come so much from how the text describes what's what, and and even where the the geology kind of leads you to suspect because of course as i said the tigris and euphrates come out of syria uh, they don't come out of jerusalem um but again uh, assuming through the 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 flood of noah which we're going to get into in our next podcast uh some of the land could have changed significantly enough that um, it no longer appears to be there, but again, from a literary perspective, my guess is that Eden is probably Jerusalem, or in the, in the immediate vicinity of Jerusalem, um, and again, that's just because of the important role that 
Jerusalem plays throughout the Old Testament. Just a note on that too, you know, there's, we're not technically allowed to go back into, as humans, we're not technically allowed to go back into the garden, um, so it doesn't really matter where it is, we're not going to be able to get back to it anyway, right. but just, um, just looking at it, um, just again, it might just be something that you find interesting. Right. And, you know, we find it interesting, that's why we wanted to talk about it. No, we've got to go back and look at the text. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um... Let's take the first paragraph. Yahweh God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Um, he formed every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight. Again, notice how this is playing off of the idea uh, in the previous paragraph, which was on the other slide. Um, before the trees grew, God make man, God makes the trees grow. Uh, again, this is typical Hebrew poetic paralleling or, or contrasting or comparing. Um, there are uh, obviously the two important trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll get a little bit more into that as the text goes on. And then we want to skip down to the last sentence in this slide. Uh, God took the man, put him into the Garden of, the Eden, of Eden to cultivate and keep it. Um, I often say uh, there's a difference between labor and work. Uh, work can be a very satisfying thing. Um, I, I think for my own, uh, to illustrate the point for, for in my own life, so for a number of years, 15 years, I worked in ministry. Um, and, and that is not one of those immediate gratification kind of jobs. You don't get to see results right away <clears throat> often they're sort of uh, quiet and subtle and behind the scenes um, but one day when I was living back in in DC uh, where I grew up we had a huge snowstorm and while I was in ministry I had to go out obviously and shovel the snow so I would go out every few hours and I'd shovel and it just kept building and building and building and at one point during this this uh, escapade um, I turned around and saw the work that I had done and man did it feel good uh, the sense of accomplishment uh, the immediate gratification, being able to see what I had done, to to see it in contrast to what else was going on, and in, in one sense, to take it back to the to the theme of the text, to to use sort of a metaphor here, um, to see the wild things, the things that had not been touched um, as the snow kept falling, and then to see the cultivated thing. The, the 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 sidewalk which I had shoveled out and the car which I had shoveled out and the the street which I had shoveled out to, to make a room uh, for my car uh, this felt so good so something that's important to keep in mind and I think the text is is kind of drawing our attention to is the difference between work and labor labor we hate in a sense um, you know it's exhaustive and you get sweaty and and you, you get tired of having to, to do stuff all the time, but yet there's something about working and achieving and accomplishing and goal setting. Um, man, in a sense, as we see from this text, is, or mankind, yeah, I don't mean man as in um, just the male of the species, um, we are made to work and to gain some satisfaction out of that uh, so it can really be a joy um, uh, to work of course there's the other end of that spectrum what we call workaholics you know their their whole uh, meaning of life is wrapped up in in their job or job title uh, and that's not what we're talking about but we are talking about the satisfaction that comes uh, from achieving things Sarah, anything else you want to say? No? Nope. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. We're going to go back through our thing. And then we're going to look at what Yahweh, God, commanded the man. He said, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Um, by die, 
God means two things here, at least is evident from um, the rest of biblical history, I should say, or the rest of the biblical text. Um, death in the scripture means to be separated from God, but it also means to be separated from the land of the living, so to speak. Um, so both things became true. Um, uh, but of course the being separated from the land of the living did not happen immediately for Adam. And we'll look at that in our next podcast. We see how long Adam lived, but of course, um, Adam did die in the sense of being separated from God's presence in the garden. But there's a little bit more to that, and we'll preview that as we come along. But I find it rather interesting, right? God makes man, puts him in the garden, and then gives him a commandment. Um, they even use the word in this particular translation, God commanded the man, saying. Um, so keep that in mind, and we'll come back to that idea as we go along. It's interesting. Paul talks about um, the law awakening sin in us and um i think that's probably kind of what's happening here um adam probably wouldn't have ever paid any attention to the tree but um just in case he did you know god wanted to give him a heads up by the way this tree will kill you and um and then it becomes super enticing at that point in time so just a, something to keep in mind when you we blame Adam and Eve a lot. Oh, they're so stupid. How can you do that? Well, we, we do the same thing every yeah. day. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that's always the point of Scripture, by the way, is not for you to see how everybody else doesn't measure up. The goal is always for you to see how you don't measure up. Um, I, I, I say sometimes um, if you judge yourself, then a lot of times you don't have to worry about how other people judge you. Um, if you are examining yourself and your thoughts and what motivates you, uh, life is a little easier in terms of relationships with other people. All right, let's uh, move on to our next slide. This is Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Uh, Yahweh God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, Yahweh God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature became its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the sky and to every animal of the field. But for man, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Uh, probably the most fascinating part about this, I'm going to let Sarah talk about this. About what? Oh, yeah. So the, um, the, so far in this, uh, book in Genesis, everything that God has made has been good. Um, that's how he describes it. Uh, creation was good. It was very good. This is the first time that we see, um, the, the phrase not good. So, um, obviously there's a distinction there as well so um and also uh, just a side note um even your dogs and cats are not <laughs> good enough um so as much as i love my dog that's snoring behind me right now um she's still not good enough mm -hmm. to to be a, a true companion right just a note right um yeah, again, back to the idea of Hebrew poetry. Um, comparing, contrasting, paralleling. It is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good, it is not good. Uh, this would capture your attention quickly. Um, remember, the whole of the Bible is a oral um, education, if you will. It is intended to be read and to be read aloud and to be heard. Um, as we said once before, we're, we have become sort of a visual learning culture, so we learn through what we see or watch. Uh, for people in this day and time, um, the real strength was the oral uh, culture, uh, uh, learning through what you hear 
or read. Um, so if th this text was being read aloud, you would probably catch something like this much easier than you would. Um, and we tend to read today in little small snippets, and, and we're sort of doing that with the podcast, because of course we're talking so much and reading so little. Um, but these are also intended to be read in one sitting. Um, so you would pick up something like this much easier or quicker. Uh, again, notice what I said before about God is contrasting the wild plants with the garden plants. Here he begins to contrast the wild animals with an animal we're going to be introduced to very shortly. Mm -hmm. um, and again, notice the uh, man naming so God got to name all the things in the beginning of creation, right? The sun, the moon, the stars, uh, um, the day, the night, um, uh, all these things God got to name because he had um, authority, maybe, uh, is a good word, over these things. But remember, he gave authority to man over the animals. Um, I think that's kind of a, uh, to use a, a, a modern phrase, uh, we're the top of the food chain. I think that's kind of a way of saying uh, we're at the top of the food chain. But again, just to, to remind you of what we said in that podcast concerning that section, authority does not mean abuse. Remember in Jesus' mind, uh, leadership meant servanthood. Um, so when you hear the term dominion, don't assume that means you can do whatever you want and there's no consequences. It means leadership with responsibility, which of course is exactly what the Garden of Eden is all about, right? We're given charge of our own destiny, if you will. Um, but Adam and Eve, just like you and I, um, uh, misuse that uh, right or that uh, authority. Um, so, anyway, for what that's worth. I think, too, if you've ever had a garden or even house plants, um, or um, you have dogs and cats, um, especially dogs and cats, um, you become just as much trained to them as they become trained to you. So there is a, a give and take in a garden. If you just put plants in that pull stuff out and you don't put any new materials in, then eventually your garden is going to die just because it runs out of nutrition for itself. So, um, you know, we're called um, to be good stewards of um, our land and of our animals. And, you know, I think we're, I don't think we put enough emphasis on that in the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And, of course, again, getting back to um, work brings satisfaction. Um, to organize and to, to work something brings a certain degree of satisfaction out of life, and that's important. All right, uh, next paragraph is Genesis two twenty one to 25. Sarah? Yahweh God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. As the man slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Yahweh God made a woman from the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and will join with his wife and they will be one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. All right. Very good. So uh, here's the creation of woman. It seems some time has passed, obviously, if, if Adam had the time to name all the creatures that came before him. Um, so in a, in a very real sense, this is the creation of woman is God's final act of creation. Um, this also piggybacks onto the idea of uh, what is meant by a day in Genesis, because I'm sure that Adam couldn't have named everything that that passed before him in 24 hours, and then was put to sleep and woke up uh, to find that woman had been made for him. Um, here, day is probably a longer period of time. Because notice it said in Genesis 1, uh, on the sixth day he created male and female. Um, but here it's giving us more detail. In fact, that's one thing we didn't talk about. Um, uh, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is sort of a bird's eye view. 
of the creation and then Genesis 2 4 to 426 which is where we're in now is um, on the ground uh, uh, looking at it much closer and in much more detail there are commentators who suggest that these are two separate creation accounts while they are in the sense of two different perspectives of the creation account but they are not two accounts they're co meant to complement each other not to contradict or to contrast each other in a sense uh, you have the same thing with Jesus's uh, resurrection accounts or with the life and ministry of Jesus himself in the Gospels uh, these are complementary to one another they're not contradictory um, and and of course people that try to point out the the contradictions of the Bible uh, already have an axe to grind against it um, so they're looking for something to point out and say aha you know um, but when you look at the text itself that's not how the text is presenting um, it, it's not meant to, to be uh, two different things I had a teacher in uh, 10th grade. She was awesome. I just saw her the other day. Super exciting. Um, but she used this passage right here um, to talk about uh, woman meat being the last uh, thing that create that God created and what is the implication of that. And I think um, sometimes as, as women, we're real defensive of our position. We are women and we should have equal rights and all that stuff. And, and yes, we should. But, um, you know, just think about the way God thinks about you. Uh, this was the final thing like you're the crowning uh jewel on the creation so don't don't take any crap from anybody right right <laughs> now that's a great point um again uh you know <laughs> it's like uh um husbands that abuse their wives or boyfriends that abuse their their girlfriends say um oh well uh the bible says you're supposed to submit to the man um so here you want to lift out this one little piece of a sentence outside of the broader context of the sentence. Um, we often see people think of this verse as somehow demeaning to women or this group of verses as somehow demeaning to women. Really the opposite seems to be the case. Um, remember in creation God is going from, in a sense, I'm, I'm using my words now, going from good things to better things to the best things. Man being, being part of the best. Well, if you apply that, um, you know, you go from plants to animals to man, good, better, best. Uh, if you apply that in this case, as Sarah was just saying, woman is the last thing that God makes, and it seems to really be the, the, the what, what was that famous uh, jewelry, um, gosh, what was that stone called? Um, oh, gosh. Um Ah, the diamond. yeah, the big diamond, the hope diamond. Yeah, this is sort of the hope diamond in God's uh, crown of creation. You know, this big dazzling thing. Um, another point that's rather interesting to make, and I first heard this from a seminary professor. Um, when you think about Jesus on the cross, and uh, in John's gospel, it records that you know he was. Uh, stabbed in the side by the centurion or the Roman guard and out of his side came water and blood and then you think about another line in the Gospel of John saying uh, to be born again is the result of water and blood um, in a sense you could say that the bride of Christ which is the church is born from his side in the same way you see this idea of the bride of Adam being born out of his side. Um, I'll just kind of leave that there. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, it, you can kind of overstretch it a little bit, but it's kind of an interesting thought. Um, by the way, there's also a teaching that says that mankind, uh, he, male kind, I should say, has one less rib then right that's an old right yeah that's weird that's yeah, weird that's right. not right <laughs> um yeah nothing could be further from the truth um remember this is sort of divine surgery right it's not that every man ever born after this has one less rib than you know, i don't know the whole idea is just kind of silly um but of course that's 
the the time in which we live we we tend not to be terribly deep thinkers you know uh, accurate. what's or accurate thinkers right where um what's the thing three miles wide and one inch deep um it it's kind of the time in which we live well we encourage you to be three miles deep even if you're only one inch wide uh anyway um notice also the last verse here in this section the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed this too is a literary preview of what is to come um lots of setting up um in genesis uh he wants you to see where you are going the reason this statement is in here is because soon they will find themselves naked and ashamed uh whereas here it says they're naked but not ashamed um yeah go ahead okay so uh just one note about hebrew there's no punctuation we've talked about this a little bit before there's not any vowels there's no punctuation there's no capitalization so um where we put quotes may or may not be where the quote actually ends just keep that in mind mm -hmm. so maybe adam was even saying the um maybe his full quote is this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she will be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore a man will leave his father and mother and will join with his wife and they will be one flesh end quote um so just just a note we don't have any punctuation to to guide us right. in the hebrew and and the reason sarah brings that up is because that is important for what we want to talk about as we sort of wrap up today so keep this in mind as we we move along